You are watching Apostolic Radio Charlotte. Amen, 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 amen. Beautiful, beautiful song. Amen. Let's stand. It's our privilege today to have uh, Brother James Feld preaching for us. He's here with his wife, and uh, he is a great preacher of faith, pastored for over 20 years, and has recently went on the into evangelistic ministry. You know, we always said evangelistic trail growing up, but people don't know what that means. They're like, what is it like? It's a, the, the trail of tears. I'm like, yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, we're honored to have these folks, and uh, I am just so glad to have uh, Brother Feld here preaching. Brother Feld, come make yourself at home. We are here to receive him. We're not going to take a little long time to get to know him. We're going to receive him and receive the word of the Lord. Preach to us, my brother. Pastor and praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. It's good to be here this morning. Feel the great presence of the Lord. Amen. Welcome you and your family. Amen. To First Church. And uh, I appreciate, amen, the leadership of this church in, uh, in modern, uh, modeling themselves after the First Church. Church that Jesus Christ started. The Book of Acts, chapter. Amen. Give honor, high honor to Bishop and Sister Elms. Amen. The great foundation and all the work they have done here through the years. Amen. God has truly blessed you. Truly blessed you. Amen. I do believe right up there probably even the greatest blessing is your children, your grandchildren. Amen. We've known your South Florida children and grandchildren for 20-something years now. and They are fantastic people. Amen. And meeting all of you today. Amen. God bless you. Honor to Pastor and Sister Elms. Amen. The fine work they are continuing to do here. And lead this church forward. Praise God. We honor them. Amen. Amen. So glad to have my uh, better half traveling with me. Anything good about me, it's because of her and the Lord working through her. And uh, so glad to have Tammy with me. Amen. Appreciate all that she means to me in my life and uh, also in ministry. Amen. If you have your Bibles, the book of 2 Thessalonians, the third chapter. If you do not have a Bible, I'm sure someone near you would be very happy to share with you. Um, if you ask and they refuse, just take it from them. They may have it on the screen. I'm not sure. Second Thessalonians. Thoroughly enjoyed the first service. This is my first time to do a double service in the a.m. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. What a great move of God we had earlier. And, and what a time we're having right now in this place. Thank you to all the singers and musicians. Amen. Such beautiful uh, singing to lead us into the presence of the Lord. Thank you to the first lady. What tremendous. I love that song. i got to find out who wrote it. I know who sings it. Amen. Sister Elm sings it. And uh, I mean, you can feel it. Feel it. I, my goodness, I just started praying right through that song. I enjoyed it. Amen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith, but the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that you both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God, into the patient waiting for Christ. I want to preach, the Lord helping me from... Verse number three and four, but the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord. Somebody say, we have confidence in the Lord. And then he said, touching you or concerning you, that God is going to help you. How many are thankful for the help of the Lord in your life, in your family? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. 
thank you for what we feel in this house. Your great and your mighty presence moving among your people. We praise you. We worship you. We thank you for your excellent greatness, your loving kindness, and your tender mercies. I pray, Lord, that you speak expressly to our hearts individually today, also corporately as a church. We will not fail to give you the praise and the glory and all of the honor in the mighty name of Jesus. Would you clap your hands and give God a shout of praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord bless you. I do realize I'm in Charlotte. I'm not in Florida. And uh, I do realize what's going on today. And uh, well aware around 6.30 what's going to kick off. Somebody has prepared and gotten themselves ready for the big game. For the big bowl. And a lot of excited people will fill the stands. And I'm sure wherever you are, you will be excited one way or the other. If you care at all for the sport. And uh, I did hear that people were already lined up and buying all of their gear and, and uh, colors and names and jerseys and, and uh, going to wear it. And then if they win right here in Charlotte, uh, and the Lord willing, they will. Can you say amen? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you might have the help of the Lord. I heard that Cam's father's a pastor, so you never know. But uh, get ready. But if they win, then the doors will open immediately. People can go in and buy, of course. It would say Super Bowl champs, and people will be excited. I'm sure they'll be excited one way or the other. Uh, but they'll make a lot of noise, will they not? Yeah. And uh, it's amazing to me, and, and uh, I hope that we can uh, remedy that always in the church, that we ought to make some noise in the church also. There's nothing wrong with that. Amen. Good things happen to you, you learn to express yourself. Isn't that true? Yes. If you were to go and hit the lottery, the help of the Lord, and you pay your tithes, <laughs> then uh, I'm sure that you would make some kind of sound after you gather yourself and realize that you've just become a millionaire or billionaire or whatever else it is, and then you'll faint when the IRS tells you how much they're taking. <clears throat> but uh, nonetheless, there are things that happen to us in our life that get us excited. We express ourselves with some kind of audible noise that comes from deep within. The greater the excitement, then the more jubilant we are and, and uh, maybe the hands fly or we jump up and on our feet. I've, I've been places where people just strip down and then paint their body the color of their team and go crazy. I remember one time I, I worked with a fellow in my younger years and, and uh, he came to work uh, after a weekend and and he had bandages all around his head and the side of his face. And, and he still showed up for his job. I said, man, what in the world happened? He said, man, I had the best time. And he told me the concert he went to. And somebody next to him kind of got excited, flipped out, and just started pounding the side of his head with brass knuckles. Uh, that's not the kind of good time I'm looking for. So if you got your brass knuckles, don't be near me in the altar later today. But uh, people get excited about a lot of things. The enemy likes to tell us that when we come to the things of God, that it should be quiet and be reserved and dignified and do not express yourself because, after all, God is not really there. That's for their churches. That's not for this church. We know that our Redeemer liveth. Somebody shout hallelujah. Paul said, I know in whom I have believed. And we will not cast away our confidence in the Lord, which hath great recompense of reward. When we get excited about the things of God, it's not make-believe. It's not because pastor or guest speaker or someone has said it. There's no wires connected under your seat. There's no button to be pushed that will super excite you and, and, and make you jump out of your seat uh, except the knowledge that we have about the God we serve. He is the living God. He is the only living God. 
Now I'll quote from you from the Bible. You don't have to take my word for it. The Lord said, somebody say the Lord said. The Lord said, the Lord said I looked on my right. The Lord said it. That he can look to the right. He can see everything to the right. Look to the left, sees everything from everlasting to everlasting. And look behind and in front. He said, I don't see any other God. There's no other God but me. Some people say, well, he's just a little too full of himself. He absolutely is. And he has the right to have full confidence in who he is. There is no God like Jehovah. I have full confidence in him. I do not have full confidence in any team that will play today because it's made up of men. I don't have any full confidence in me for in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. There's nothing good about me. Without the leading of the Holy Ghost, I will cheat you, rob you, curse at you, hate you. They asked the wrong speaker to be here today, didn't they? It's the truth. There's nothing good about man. We're all born in sin and shaped in iniquity. There's nothing good. We confront as though there's some good about us, but there is nothing good about us. Jesus said, there is none good but one that is my Father which is in heaven, or the Spirit which is in heaven. Even the almighty God's flesh, his own prepared flesh, he said, there's none good. Don't call me good. There's none good but the Spirit which is in heaven. That flesh had to learn obedience, the Bible says, by the things that he suffered. Jesus, God in flesh, had to deal with things, tempted in all points like as we are, struggling with things that you and I struggle with, dealing with pains in his body and adversity in life and opposing and contrary winds and attitudes and spirits. Not everybody on the planet liked him. Jesus did every known miracle to man, known to man, and yet the Bible says they walked away. 70 at a time and larger crowds and they abandoned him and left him. You can do all the great works of the Lord and some people still will not like you. Right. Amen? Amen. Jesus worked these miracles, performed them, raised people from the dead and some still do not believe. They saw it, excited about it, some of them, but didn't even believe. Jesus uh, had a man that had uh, a withered hand that was in an audience one day, like the audience you're sitting in today. And the Bible said, it was a Sabbath, and the Lord told him, said, stretch forth thine hand. And his withered hand unraveled and became whole and functional as his other complete and whole hand had been all his life. You would think that everybody in the church house, because it was in the church house, you think everybody would have been smiling, excited, did you see it? I want to shake that hand. I want to, I want to get where Jesus is. I want to feel what it is to be next to him. Right. See, I'm, I'm of the belief that when we come to church, we ought to be like the people that go to the red carpet for some Tony awards or whatever else is going on. And they're stretching and craning their necks and leaning over the rope and screaming, what are you wearing? And what's, who are you? And, and all this stuff, can you sign my body? And can you sign this? We ought to be pressing towards God in that same manner because we have confidence that God's the only one that can heal us, the only one that can deliver us, the only one that can work and do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Maybe your first time guest here today. We welcome you and we're glad that you're here. But, but I am super excited about my God. He never loses. He's never without options. He never scratches the side of his head and wonders what to do. He has all things worked out for all of his children. He knows how to navigate his people. Many are the afflictions of God's people. That's in your Bible. There are many afflictions to those that are living righteous and holy and godly in this present evil day. But he said the Lord knows how to deliver him out of all his trouble. We might have trouble, but we got a God that knows how to get us out of trouble. We got a God that knows how to scramble. We know a God that knows how to get out of the pocket. We've got a God that knows how to call an audible. We've got a God. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. Woo. My goodness, I like first church. I love this church. Good job, Bishop and Pastor. 
my goodness, to feel and to have response to the goodness of God. He said, we have confidence in God, full confidence in God. Do not try to serve God, live in Christianity lifestyle, which means Christ-like. Do not try to do that unless you have full confidence in God. If you're trying to lead a Christian lifestyle, but having confidence in yourself to go through trials and tribulations and hardship and difficulties and whatever it may be and make it to the new heaven and the new earth and your confidence is solely in yourself. As a matter of fact, let me tell you a scripture. Here's what he said in one place. He said, if you have confidence in God, only in this life, you will be of all men most miserable. You have got to get outside of this planet, this galaxy, beyond what we know and see with our natural eye, hear with our natural ear. you got to have confidence in God to take you beyond the grave. He that believeth in me, though he be dead, yet shall he live. That means eternal life. This is not just church lingo. This is not just cliches that we say in the church. Eternal life is is true and real. This is not religious setting that you're in today. This is a church with a personal experience with the only true, all-wise, all-knowing and living God whose name is Jesus. Amen. You say, well, what about the other gods and the other lords? All right, I'll talk about them for a moment since you asked. Jesus said there are small g gods, many, and small l lords, many. See, that capital L means Lord God, Lord God Almighty, all might and all power to him. But he says there's small l and small g gods and lords. There's many of them, but he says, guess what? He said they have ears, but their ears don't hear. They've been shaped by the hand of a man through some material, whether he cut a tree down in the forest and shaped it into a god, or maybe he got a hold of some uh, piece of glass or whatever, and he shaped it, and he's got ears and eyes and a nose and feet and hands. He said, but they don't hear. They cannot touch you. They cannot walk to you. I heard not long ago about a particular religion, and they serve these gods, and their gods are that big. They're itty bitty gods that are carved and once a year they go to a particular place and have this big meeting and they bring their gods in a suitcase. And they carry them in this briefcase. They bring it to this location. They open the briefcase. They set their gods out. People worship and do all they're going to do for the meeting. They put them back once a year, put them back in the suitcase, take them back where they got them from. Because listen, when your God is fashioned by man's hands, he can only go where you transport him to go. But the God I'm talking about is an omnipresent God. There is no suitcase. Nobody has to carry him. Nobody has to go get him. He is an ever-present help in the time of need whether you're a first time guest or a long time member he cares about you he's concerned about you he loves you he died on Calvary's cross for you and he showed up at first church for you and your family for the promise is not just for you it's for your children and your children's children everybody in your family can have this When service is over today, pastor or ushers or deacons will not get out a suitcase. We will not pack any God. We will not put him in some conference room until Wednesday night Bible study. God that we serve, the true living God, does what he wants when he wants. He's a sovereign God. He's not on a leash. You don't have to text him, Google him, find out where he's at, GPS him. He is but a stone, I'm quoting, stones throw away from any one of us. Just a little flick of a wrist and the stone scatters. He said, that's how close God is to you. You can reach out and touch him. Well, I, I'm not a member of First Church. I, you are a living, breathing human being and God made you in your mother's womb. You don't have to be a member of this church for God to love you and touch your life and change you. We have all confidence that God loves you. We have every bit of confidence that our God loves you every bit as much as he loves us. He's died for every one of us. He's your God too. Clap your hands and shout hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I like what I feel in this place. In 
nothing wrong with getting excited because we don't serve a dead God. We serve a living God that we have full confidence in. Well, I'm struggling with some things right now, preacher, and my confidence is kind of waning a little bit. I'm, I'm not really where I should be because if God was really God, then all this stuff would not be happening to me or to our, uh, our country or to the world or any of these things. You have to read your Bible and get perspective on things and understand. Go to the author of all existence, not just human existence, but all existence, whatever planet there may be and whether there be people on it I don't know but if there are God created them too everything that lives and breathes and moves God created it he is life he is light he is nobody breathes without God God made man and woman, woman from the rib of a man. He created both of them male and female and he created in his own likeness and he gave us to be a little higher than the animals. Somebody say thank God. Thank God I'm standing on two feet upright. Equilibrium's working fine. And I've got all my motor skills and all my senses and everything's good. We are a dominant people, are we not? Meaning, meaning that we are above the animals. We can subdue all things. We've got power and authority that comes from God. That's the first level of power and authority that comes from God is human power and authority. He said, let man be created in the image of God. Let man have dominion and authority. Let man dress the garden and keep the garden. There's no tree greater than you. There's no serpent wrapped around a tree greater than you. There's no roaring lion that's king of any jungle that a man exists in. Man is the authority and power. He represents God on the planet. That's our first birth. That's our first right. But Adam and Eve messed that up and fell away from God. But God said, I'll restore it. And I'm not going to leave man in a fallen state. But I am going to provide. That's why I got full confidence in God. He didn't give up on humanity because humanity gave up on him and said, we'd rather be like other people. We'd rather be gods like you. God said, I'm still going to fix it. He knew. Adam didn't do this. Eve didn't do this. The devil had done this, and when the Lord gave out the four curses in the garden of Eden, and he laid it on man and woman and, and upon the earth, but then he turned to the serpent, he said, you have allowed this. You did this. In other words, of all created animals, this created animal had yielded its body to the work of an unclean spirit. What it did. You allowed this to happen in the New Testament. And I, I, I'll try to keep it uh, as, as, uh, as simple as I can, but I do need to say this. At the Last Supper, Jesus said, there's one of you that sits at, the, sits at the table with me that shall betray me. And each of them around the table began to say, is it I? Is it me? Well, I betrayed. They didn't know who it was of the 12. And they told John, the beloved, head on the chest of Christ, uh, sitting there. And he, the Lord loved him and he was close to the Lord. And they said, John, John, would you ask him who it is? Is it me? Is it him? Who is it that shall betray? And the Lord had to clarify it by saying, he that dippeth in the sop with me, he that breaketh this bread, dips in the sop, the juice at the bottom of the bowl, he shall be my betrayer. But each of them asked, is it I? Because they'd all been tempted to be that weak link and that willing vessel that the enemy could work through. Every one of us knows what that is because we've all been in that situation starting with me. I remember before I was in Christ and I can remember times in Christ when the enemy got the better of me. We're not perfect people, meaning never make a mistake, but we can become perfect people in the Bible sense of being whole or complete. Paul said we are complete in Christ. That's why some of you are here today that you've not yet found Christ, but you're looking for him, and you're going to find him today. Let me tell you why. Because you're not complete till you're in him. He's the creator of your body, your mind, your spirit, your emotions, your soul. He is that creator. And when you get in a service, you are moving towards him. And the Lord said, if anybody moves in my direction, I will move towards him. And if two things are working towards each other, they will collide. And I have full confidence that God's going to collide with somebody today. That God is going to make contact with some new person today. Somebody said, well, I, I don't, I don't want to betray Christ. I don't want to do wrong. We all fail him at times. He said, rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. For if I fall, he said, when I fall, amen, I shall arise. 
Everybody makes mistakes. Every man and woman in the Old Testament to New Testament had made mistakes and failed God. Every major and minor prophet, everybody that God ever called and worked with that was a human being, they failed God. The angels, some of them left their first estate, walked away from God. The Lord had to rebuke them in Revelation, had to deal with them. It talks about it. Everything and everybody has failed God at least once and most many and multiple times. But God is a God that knows how to forgive. He is not a taskmaster. You see the end of God, Job said, how he is pitiful and of tender mercy. That God will not beat you while you're down. But Psalmist David said, he's the lifter up of mine head. God. Somebody shout hallelujah. There was a woman in the New Testament. The Bible says she was caught in the very act of adultery. You know, in that situation, I worry about the people that were looking to find somebody in that situation. Anyway, I'm sorry, Pastor. I need to keep it simple, right? Kiss up here. Just keep it simple, stupid. Okay, so... She was caught in the very act of adultery. Usually people that are seeking that out are people that are guilty, but they don't want the eyes looking at them, so they find somebody they think is doing worse than they are. They found this woman. They snatched her out of where she was in the act of adultery. They dragged her to the feet of Jesus. They threw her at the feet of Jesus, said Moses' law says that we are to stone them. Usually people that are accusers always use Bible. And said, uh, we're going to, uh, Moses' law says we are to uh, stone her to death. We have the right to do that. Look at here. We purchased our stones. We've got nice, big, beautiful. We've shaped them, shined them, had them sitting on our shelves at home, waiting for the perfect opportunity that we might show our true Christianity. And we've come loaded today. And they were ready. And their coats were off and they were getting so they can get a full swing and release and, and, and let this thing fly like a major league baseball pitcher. They were ready to go. And the Lord, the Bible says, knelt down and wrote in the sand there. Doesn't say what he wrote, but he knelt down and he wrote in the sand. Then he told these people, he said, those of you without sin cast the first stone. All stones were dropped. Everybody left. He said to the woman, woman, where are thine accusers? Through her sobs and teary-eyed, she looked around. She says, they're all gone. He said, then neither do I condemn thee. Here's the string attached. If you think there's always strings attached, go and sin no more. That's the great secret to success is to get out of sin and stay out of sin. And I know the secret formula. It's to repent of your sins, be baptized in Jesus' name, and be filled with the Spirit of God. It's a Holy Spirit, not an unholy spirit. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you can have power to overcome spirits that keep messing you up. You're just trying to be the good created being that God made you in your mother's womb. But there's always somebody that yields to an unclean spirit. It comes slithering around, talking in your ear and troubles you and gets you to make a mistake. I want you to know that God knows who you are. He knows who they are. He understands unclean spirits and he doesn't hate humanity. God is love. God is love. And you say, well, if God is love, then why did God thrust Adam and Eve out of the garden? Well, I would argue that they put themselves out through disobedience. But nonetheless, they had to go. They went out of the garden. Remember, the garden was a great place the Lord had created, and there was no rain there. There was no sun burning the grass. There were no thorns or thistles. There was no chinch bug. There was no negative thing. Everything was good and right and wholesome. Everything was wonderful. There was a dew that covered the ground, a mist that covered like dew. It covered everything, watered everything. Everything was good and pleasant and wonderful and, and growing properly and no, no disease or sickness to the trees. Everything was wonderful and great. The temperature was always like San Diego, about 70 degrees. It was wonderful, good stuff, and, and everybody wanted to live there and be there, but because they had disobeyed God, now they have to leave this perfect place. They didn't know what stress was. They didn't know what fear, doubt, and unbelief were. They didn't know what working by the sweat of one's face or brow was. They didn't know what it was to build a place to live in and how it was to give birth to children and the pain there. They didn't know these things because God didn't have that plan for them. God had good things things planned for them and you can eat of all trees of the garden of Eden save the one tree in the middle the tree of knowledge of good and evil you cannot eat thereof so the Bible says that he puts them out of the garden he puts an angel at the at the threshold the entrance to the garden with a flaming fire of sword that turns every which way 
So there's no way to get back in. Catch you coming from any direction. And you say, well, that seems harsh. It's not harsh. God did it because God was protecting what he created, which was good. And he says, I must do this lest they now in their fallen state also eat of the tree of life and live forever. God, as much as he loves us, loves his truth and will protect his truth. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. You cannot try to detract from it, take away from it, say I want Jesus but not truth. You cannot have Jesus without having truth. He is truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes unto the Father or the Spirit except by him. I'm the door to the sheepfold. That's right. Well, I'm going to find myself another way. That's what Adam and Eve thought. And it was a hard way, was it not? A hard and a difficult way. But God is not interested in you and I going that way. The devil told Eve, he said, in the day that thou eatest thereof, the, the Lord knows. God knows. God, don't ever let the devil be the one that tells you what God knows. Okay. So, <laughs> so you have, he said, the day you eat thereof, their eyes shall be open and you shall be like God. They were already like God, created in his image. Devil trying to, you're going to know things. You're going to see things. Listen, God's not holding you back from good things. No good thing. I'm quoting, no good thing will he withhold from them that do love him or fear him or respect him. God said, every good, every perfect gift cometh down from the father of lights. Any good and perfect thing in your life comes from God. Hell and chaos doesn't come from God. Confusion, God's not the author of confusion. God didn't create confusion. Confusion is in the planet because man is living in a fallen state. But you can get in this old ship of Zion. You can get on Noah's ark. You can get into a place of safety under the protection of a man of God that can cover you with the word of God that no evil can touch you. A thousand can fall at one hand. Ten thousand at another. But it shall not come nigh unto you. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear and of whom shall I be afraid? Nobody and nothing. You can walk in confidence when you have full confidence in God. And I've got full confidence in him that God has been doing this business for a long time and God knows how to run his business. God knows how to navigate you. God has brought you from your birth right to this church on this day. And you had no idea you'd be at this church praising God on Super Bowl Sunday when Charlotte is in the game. But God moved it to 630. And he had passed to go to 2 a.m. services. God's smart. God's smart. He said, I'll catch you. I'll get you. I'll trap you. I, why? Because he loves you. The Bible says the blessings of the Lord shall track you down. They shall overtake you. God is not trying to hurt you. He's trying to bless you. He's moving in your direction because he loves you more than your mother, more than your father. Woo. He loves you. He said the very hairs of your head are numbered. Some of us, that's a big job. Some, it's a little job. Mine's a big job till you get back here. And it's a real easy job. The hairs of the head are numbered. Knows you intimately. Made every intricate part of you. Things that are comely and things that are not so comely. He made them all. The inside, the guts, everything. He made us. He made us in his image. He loves us. Do not allow the enemy to tell you, God doesn't like you. God's not for you. God has not helped you. God, God will help anybody that comes through the right avenue and the right way. Somebody shout hallelujah. Doesn't matter if you're caught in the act of adultery. John 4, Jesus sat on a well, Jacob's well, and he sat there and a woman came. He said, go call thy husband. She said, I've had, uh, she, said, she said, I don't have a husband. The Lord said, you have well said. Listen to this in the Bible. You have well said, you have no husband. For you've had five husbands. And the one you're currently living with is not your husband. Y'all know this was in the Bible? Some of y'all look at me like, that's in the Bible? That sounds like People Magazine or something, or Us Magazine, or, yeah, this is not just the 21st century. This was way back in the first century. He said, you've had five husbands, the one you current, but this was private. Not even the disciples were there. It was a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And she did not get angry with him when he shed a little light that I know you. I know you. I know your lifestyle. I understand your hurt, your pain, your failed marriages. And you've given up on marriage. You won't even marry the fellow you're with right now. You'd rather just kind of live together. He said, but I understand that. But I'm here to help you. She said, sir, 
I perceive that thou art a prophet. I perceive. She ran back to Samaria. My people, I'm half Jew, half Gentile. She ran back to the Samaritans and said, come see a man that's told me everything I've ever done. We need to stop getting upset because God knows everything we've ever done. God's not trying to expose you because he hates you. This is not the Oprah show. Don't turn yourself inside out for me, but you can talk to God who knows everything. You can spill the beans to God. You can talk about your hurt, your pain, your difficulty, your emotional scarring, your bruising in your life and God says I want you anyway I want you anyway I've got full confidence that my God loves you in spite of in spite of every pain every heartache all trouble he loves you and I've got full confidence God's going to touch you one of the biggest problems with going to church not here I'm here. I'm judging this church. This is not this kind of church. But some churches, you go to church, you meet the people and not God. But pastor told me this morning, he said, we're invisible. Don't even worry about it. I'm invisible. You're invisible. We're all invisible. This is about God. This ain't about us. And that's the problem when we meet people. And people that do not get healing are still hurting. And people that are hurt, hurt people. But this church believes in deliverance. We believe in an about face. Repentance is not tears. It's not in crying and shaking and convulsing. Repentance is you stop doing what was wrong. And you start doing what's right. Somebody shout hallelujah. And anybody can turn around because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Doesn't matter what you've done. God's not looking at your past. He's looking at you here right now. He's sitting on the well like he did with that woman saying, I know you, I understand you, and I've sent away the judgmental folk because I want to fix your life. Watch it. And I'm getting ready to close. The Bible says the disciples came back where they had went to the nearby town to buy food, bread and meat, cheese and whatever. And they came back and the Lord spoke to them. And uh, he sa- they said, sir, you need to eat. Come on, you're famished. You haven't eaten in a while. We purchased things. He said, I'm not hungry. And they, they reasoned among themselves. What, did somebody else bring him food before we did? How dare they do that? You know, these were like, they, they thought they were his secret service. You know, they really did. They stopped people from coming to Jesus. Ma'am, I'm sorry, your kids cannot come. He's too busy. Secret service. Eagle is moving. Okay? They, they thought that. Some people still believe that kind of stuff. Jesus is not scared of anybody. Nobody needs to block his way. You can come with your children, as troubled as they may be. You can come with your spouse, as troubled as the marriage may be. Jesus is not scared of you. He will sit you down. He will have a conversation with you. And guess what? He's the best psychologist there's ever been. He's the best psychiatrist there's ever been. He is above all, through all, and in you all. He can do exceeding abundantly above all. He can do it, friend. And you can come in here talk to him and he'll fix it and they said has anybody fed him is he angry with us because we didn't come quicker and 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 what and he went ahead and ate it and the bible says he told them i have meat to eat that you know not of he taught that woman that bible study saved her soul reached that community and he says i'm fine i'm not even hungry because he was eating on spiritual things He was fulfilled. He lost all physical appetite or cravings for things. And he was completely at ease and comfortable and was not famished because he had ministered to somebody. You are not going to destroy God because he needs to minister to you. You are not going to deplete him of his energy and his strength and his power and his authority. God can fix everything in all of our lives on this planet at the same time. And he is doing it right now. He's working in California and Jamaica and El Salvador. He's working everywhere at the same time. And yet he's still almighty God. Filling all space and all time. God is able to do it. You don't need to worry about it. If you're you're worried about that, you're thinking about a lesser God, a small G God. I'm talking about the big G God. The capital L Lord. I'm talking about the one that can handle all things. Who could put... Just a few hundred, 300 men against hundreds of thousands of enemy and give them the victory. God could put a little shepherd boy, little physical strength and ability. Musicians could come and put him up against over nine foot tall Goliath. Spearhead weighed over 50 pounds. He was a giant. Six fingers on each hand. Six 
toes on each foot. I saw the other day someone had posted a picture of this man, and he had seven on the hand and the other hand, and seven toes on each foot. Man, he had a wide foot. That's a big shoe. These things happen. And none of these things hindered Goliath. He was a champion of the Philistines. He knew how to move. He wasn't a big fella that couldn't dunk. He could dunk. He could tear the gold down. He was powerful. He was their champion. Many notches in his belt. But here comes David. David said, you come against me with sword and spear. Physical, carnal, natural artillery. That's what you come against me with. But I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Let me tell you, whatever's troubling you, I don't care how big the addiction is, the trouble is, the marital disagreement is, the divorce is, the, whatever is, the loss in your life, whatever it is, however big and insurmountable it may seem, God is able to fix it. Well, it just seems like a small little church to me. Ain't nothing small about this church. Let God open your eyes. There are many angels that work on behalf of the church. There are ministering spirits that are in this house. Your trouble is no trouble for my God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Your hang-ups are no problem for my God. I have full confidence that God can touch you and heal you and deliver you today. If you believe it, would you stand to your feet with me and release your faith with hands lifted high. This altar's open if you need physical healing, if you need emotional healing, if you need spiritual healing. Maybe you've been hurt at a church somewhere. God can fix it and God can help you. Come line up here at this altar. I want to pray with you. Wonderful people that love you want to pray. This is your new day, new opportunity in this new year. Hallelujah. Come express yourself to him. There's nothing you can tell God that's going to wow him. Knock him off his game. He knows all things. That's it, young people. Come on, we live in a difficult world. But we don't serve a difficult God. Hallelujah. Altar workers are coming. Someone may lay a gentle hand on your back or on your shoulder just to support and help and let you know someone's with you. They're not trying to scare you or run you off. If you'd like to speak to one of them, just open your eyes and talk to them. They can answer questions, give you Bible verses. But God is going to touch you. God is going to touch you. That's it. He cares. You are not alone on this planet. You may have been forsaken by some people, but not by God. God knows. He interprets every tear. The groan, the moan, things you cannot articulate. You cannot put into words. This is the church for you. I know this first family. They are loving people. They would never hurt anybody. The saints of this church. you would talk to anybody at a coffee shop just just express yourself here I am Lord I've been struggling I've lost a loved one I'm grieving I've got a child strung out on drugs Lord I don't know what else to do I've got a family member serving time I I don't know how to handle it Lord my heart is broken come on you're talking to God Ah, he created all psychologists He gave him the brain and the wherewithal. He created all doctors. There's no charge for what God's doing in your life right now. We don't charge anybody. We received it freely. We give it freely. Get all that you want to give. Stay as long as you like. Receive. Receive it. Folks are receiving the Holy Ghost. Folks are getting a breakthrough. It's not wrong to cry, it's proper to cry. It's a natural reaction. Thank you for watching Apostolic Radio Charlotte. Come, worship with us. Waiting.